Welcome to Action Cut and Everything In Between, episode number seven. Today I'm talking with Che Baker about his film Blue World Order and about the process that you need to go to when you're a first time filmmaker to get a big name star in your film like Billy Zane and the processes that go with that and unfortunately the boring side of things like your tax and all that, getting all your accounts in order in order to reach out, get distribution and be able to pull in big names like that. This is an awesome interview and people are going to get a lot out of this. So without further ado, let's jump on in. Welcome to Action Cut and Everything in Between, a comprehensive guide to shooting a feature film all on your own. Okay, Jay Baker, welcome to the show. How are you, mate? I'm fantastic. Yourself? Now I've made you wait for a while while I get my, my technical uh, glitches under control. That's all right. We're, we're all there now. Um, thanks for giving up your Friday evening. I really appreciate it. No problem. Good stuff. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did your filmmaking journey begin? Uh, look, I, I started my storytelling career when my mother used to ask me to uh, why I hadn't cleaned my room on a Friday every every week as a kid, and I would come up with all kinds of um, excuses for that. And so I, I learned to be creative very from a very young age. Um, and then when I was uh, initially sort of when I was finishing high school, I'd had a lot of interests and didn't know whether I was going to do astrophysics or sports science or art or, you know, any of these other things. And it was my um, my martial arts instructor, actually, who said to me, what would you do if you didn't have to work, if you didn't have to work for money? And um, sort of said, I'll, I'd make movies. And he said, well, do that because if you love something, you'll be good at it. And if you're good enough at anything, you'll make a living. And uh, so, yeah, that's what I did. I went to university for, for filmmaking and... Um, the rest is not quite history, but um, that sort of led on to a career of working on in and around films, um, on crews initially. Um, I went to the States and did an exchange in North Carolina and worked on Dawson's Creek for a season and a couple of other um, films and TV series and uh, made my own little independent film on 16 mil, as you do when you're... 19 and um, you think it's a great idea <laughs> and you have no money um, and then sort of came back to Australia and got very much a little bit I don't want to say sidelined but moved I moved into the the tech side of it so I became Apple's um, final cut and and pro apps guy over here so I was sort of um, their master mentor trainer certifying everyone in teaching editing and and um those things so really went down the tech side of it and and built my skills in um the nuts and bolts of how to make a film um and that journey sort of continued along the way um all the while trying to write and direct my own stuff in the background but um you know corporates and tvcs and and things uh for 20 years before I sort of finally came to the point where I was ready to jump off. Yeah, nice. I noticed as well on your IMDb that you were on The Hobbit as an on-set colorist, was it? Yeah, um, so that was one of the things. I was fortunate enough to go over and work, you know, on crew. I was always trying to learn. I was actually doing a, um, I had just sort of started a PhD in stereoscopic storytelling, so I was really interested in you know, the new 3D um, system that had sort of come out. And um, and I was really into, you know, at that stage, I was sort of a, a digital guy. And um, the DP of The Hobbit, um, Andrew Lesney, um, amazing guy, and um, kindly asked me to come over and sort of help interpret for him with the crazy digital world because he was very much um, a film guy. Um, and he'd never shot 3D before and he'd never shot um, film before. Um, and he really wanted a uh, someone on set who could help grade for him quickly and give him an idea of what things were going to look like at the back end. So, yeah, I spent a year in working on The Hobbit and that was uh, an incredible experience. Yeah, I bet. That's awesome. So I noticed you've shot a number of short films um, and you came second in Tropfest. So... 
how do you go from a short film to I'm going to go and make a full on feature film? Yeah, look, I um, I worked on a lot of uh, things. I yeah, I edited a film that did well in Tropfest, and um, I think very much the experience of working on The Hobbit was the final motivation to let me see the difference between working on films and making your own films. So, you know, I was working on you know, virtually the biggest production in history at that time, and you're a very small cog in a very big machine. Um, but the process is the same. There's just a lot more people to do all the things. Um, I think that really motivated me to go, okay, when I get home, I'm, I'm, I'm ready now. Like I felt like I knew enough that if everyone else dropped dead, I'd be able to <laughs> finish it myself <laughs> enough, a little bit about everything. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was certainly a, uh, an interesting experience. And I came back to, decided to shoot in hometown of Canberra because it was a place where you know, we could get a film done with the resources that we had. So, you know, there was a lot of, we designed a film around um, the locations that we had and the resources that we had. And um, I mean, as you know, Canberra's uh, got some pretty unique looking landscapes, which um, I'm not the first, nor will I be the last to take advantage of. Yeah, it's great. And when you were putting the script together for the film, like it's got so much in it, it's so full on. Like, it's it's a massive project for your first feature, isn't it? I mean, the the stunts and the action and the locations, and you know, you got some big names in there as well, like Billy Zane. And when you were putting the script together, did you just throw everything in and then think, okay, we'll work out if we can do it <laughs> l later? Or no, actually, look, it was it was a bit of um, smoke and mirrors with with the whole thing. The film certainly grew from. We went in with the idea of doing an ultra lean, ultra low budget film that sort of mirrored the world that we were going to create. So we were going to use, the world was all about scavenged resources and, and using only what you could find. And so initially it was just going to be my friend and I in Dallas um, acting and running around with a 5D and shooting each other and, you know, really bare bones, lean thing. And we did that because it was kind of like, this will get us going. And then once you're going, things get a bit of a momentum of themselves and people start offering their resources and time and opportunities open up that aren't necessarily there at the start. And, you know, as you would know yourself and speaking to other, you know, independent and first time filmmakers, no one trusts you, you know, no one, you're, you're a nobody until you're uh, somebody and doesn't matter how much corporate or how much whatever you've done in the background um no one you know you're you're an unknown quantity so we certainly decided to go in very low and lean and as we got going um things started to or opportunities came up i won't say they ballooned out opportunities came up that weren't there opportunities to cast people who were not interested initially suddenly were because the film was real and then People started putting some money in. I started getting some better investors. And there was a, a tipping point where it was, well, we either do it for a certain budget and try and make that back in sales, super low, or you kind of go above the the offset threshold and um, it becomes a different kind of film then. You need to uh, deal with all the tax breaks and the implications of that and then you need to make the film a high enough budget that the production quality is going to be high enough to get real sales in in the market and all that sort of thing so um, we initially scripted the film pretty low um, but then as the ball got rolling we looked we looked at certain elements and we just swapped them out for the the bigger better versions so for example there was a a broadcast tower in the film that was initially a um you know a radio telephone tower that was on the side of the road 
and then you know the opportunity came up we're like oh wouldn't it be great to use to use telstra tower for that that's what we really wanted to do so then you know we couldn't have approached them early on but by the time we got some big names in the film going suddenly they were interested so you know we systematically re replaced the the small shitty um, uh, options with the the bigger better options along the way yeah cool so not having that trust how do you actually go and approach these investors or apply for funding yeah look that was really um it's the million dollar question or quite literally the million or several million dollar question <laughs> um usually you know everyone everyone talks big and everyone over promises and under delivers in this sort of world and I was quite adamant that I was not going to be that guy. Um, so I spent a good, good probably year and a half working out how I could guarantee to get my investors their money back. Um, and that meant building relationships with potential investors, working really hard on our business plan, um, but also not going through the government agencies for funding. You know, we, we did it all privately and independently. And I sort of came up with this model where I was like, well, I'm either an idiot or a genius and I don't know which one. And I won't know which one for a while. Um, one of the things that I think helped me was I had just published a novel um, and several of the investors read that. And I think that helped me get over the line in a way because it it just showed that I had finished something and that um, I had achieved something and getting published is you know argu arguably just as hard as getting a film up in some ways um, so I think that gave them the confidence that I would see it through um, and a lot of them you know they just took a risk and it, it's a bit of a it's a momentum thing you get one investor on board and they very often go, oh, you know, I'm putting a bit of money into this thing and they've got a few mates and their mates will go in and they'll put, you know, a few grand in each rather than, you know, one big person. So there was, it's certainly a, a game of um, you tick one box and then seven or eight things follow that. You know, you get a distributor on board, suddenly that unlocks you know, the offset for you. And then you have the confidence to be able to go and say, well, I've got a certain guarantee of a return from the government um, tax rebates. Therefore, the investors are going to get at least 40% of their money back or something. So I think there's certainly um, uh, sort of a trail of um, key points that unlock other things. It's almost like a bonus level. You know, you, you nail that one thing and then four things follow that. Yeah, cool. So how did you learn about all these kind of tax offsets and things like that? Yeah, look, that's that's actually the the crux of it. You know, I, no one tells you about that stuff, really. I mean, the information is there, but it's just, you know, everyone's got a script. Everyone wants to be a director. Everyone, Everyone's got a great idea for a film, and you're like, well, that's nice. <laughs> Go and make it. The difference between actually getting a film made or not is is being prepared to do all the stuff that facilitates what you really want to do, like cleaning the toilets of the group house that you've rented for your cast and dealing with the accounting laws and the tax laws and all the stuff that you really don't want to do because everyone's like, oh, I'm looking for a producer because they all want someone else to deal with all the mundane stuff and they want to do all the creative. And I think it was just, understanding that I had to become an expert in all the stuff I didn't love to facilitate doing the small part of the job that you do love. And, you know, <laughs> as uh, as you know, you, you kind of, once you get into it, it's actually quite fun as well. It's a challenge to, you know, work with the the very over-regulated legals and the, um, you know, the very specific tax and accounting stuff. I never thought I'd get into tax, but once you get right into it, it's sort of, you start to understand things that other filmmakers don't necessarily get yet because they haven't had that education and it gives you a leg up. 
Yeah, it's a great, great skill to have. Something that I'll have to tackle um, one day, but <laughs> for now, I'll just. Well, mate, um, if I can, if I can, um, if I can help you not make the same mistakes as me, I'll be very glad. To. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, really good. So, you had um, Billy Zane star in the film. How do you go about approaching a, a big name like that? Yeah, look, it's it's really interesting the way that things happen organically. Um, we had, you know, we, we had several cast that we started the film or, you know, planned to have the film with and we cast them and we rehearsed and things. And then a whole bunch of things happened. Our, our lead guy, um, got a big, uh, TV series, um, in the States. So he pulled out uh, two weeks before the shoot, um, and replaced him with the only other guy that. I'd, I had also approached, um, finally got back to me <laughs> about a week before, so that was great. And then uh, our lead female that we had, um, she was fantastic, and it was literally, uh, I think it was the Friday, and we were shooting on the Monday, and we were doing a, a script read-through rehearsal, and um, she got a call at lunchtime from her agent saying she'd landed a big gig as well, and she pulled out, you know, yeah, she was under contract and we paid her, but she just paid the money back and paid the breach because it was, you know, we couldn't compete with the, mm. the level of money she was going to get from the other gig. So we're suddenly, you know, we're recasting that Friday night for a new lead. And so you end up shooting, you know, you prep all this, this film and uh, we had the opportunity in some of these other roles to potentially cast up. So we started shooting... And then there was a role that um, we were like, oh, we'll try and cast this particular role with a, a name in there. Um, and we went out to all the sort of Australian, um, you know, A-listers we could. I think there was Sam Neill and David Wenham and um, a few other people of that ilk. And Jack Thompson was one of those. And uh, Jack was the only one who got back to us. He actually, his agent passed a script on and he read it and loved it at script stage. I didn't realise that Jack, really loved sci-fi he used to be a biochemist and you know he just kind of dug the the vibe um whereas i i doubt the agents even passed it on to the other guys um so then what happened was while we were waiting to hear back from uh jack on a whim i also called up uh billy because i had when i was in north carolina 20 years earlier um i'd worked on a film with billy i was a a lowly, I was actually the friend of Billy's driver and he had brought Billy out to karaoke with us one night and we bonded over karaoke. <laughs> um, and I just kept in touch with him over the years when he'd come to Australia. I'd, I'd bumped into him again and um, shot a music video for him, for one of his friends. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I knew him um, and we'd always said, oh, it'd be great to work together at some point. But, you know, I, I never had the project. Anyway, so I'd gone out to Billy for the same role that we'd, you know, gone out to Jack and everyone else for. Um, and he was like, yeah, I'd love to. love to do it. And I was, I was like, oh, okay. And then Jack, uh, Jack came back and said yes. And we're like, right. <laughs> <laughs> so suddenly we had the problem of Jack Thompson and Billy Zane both wanting this role. Yeah. And... Um, you know, you just go, well, where do you go from there? Um, and the challenge was from a, you know, a legal and a logistical point of view, it was just a whole lot easier for Jack you know, to do it. And it was very, very difficult, the, the amount of approvals and minister sign-offs and stuff we had to get to get Billy over and stuff. Turn around and said, oh, man, you know, we're going to, know maybe maybe in the sequel and by then he was like he'd sort of psyched himself up for it i guess he's like no fuck away i've worked too hard you put me in this movie and so so i had quite literally a sleepless night wondering and we're already shooting by this stage um wondering how i'm going to deal you know if i patch up this relationship with billy and um i went oh you know maybe we could swap his role and give him like the the main sort of bad guy role um which we'd already cast and we'd already rehearsed and you know I had a and I suggested that to Billy and he was like yeah he was totally for it 
So, but you know, he wasn't going to stay any longer, and he wasn't. Uh, we were going to have to pay him more anyway. <laughs> so, um, so suddenly that was good. But then I, uh, you know, had to make a very diff- difficult phone call to the guy that we had cast in that role, who was a, a Korean guy, because originally the this role was like a North Korean general. Um, and uh, oh, a guy playing a Korean guy. Um, and so I paid him anyway. I paid him his full fee and he said, I'm really sorry, but this is the opportunity. This is what I... And he was actually very gracious about it. He was like, great, I get paid. I don't have to do the job, no <laughs> worries. So anyway, so that's how we ended up with, um, yeah, a bunch of names. It's all, um, you know, it's all sort of serendipity and, and momentum, I think. Yeah, it's great. How long did the film take to shoot? Um, look, our initial, our initial principal photography was like five weeks in January, um, and then we sort of cut it together. And then there was a whole bunch of, um, you know, things where we were like, well, you know, in the script it says they escape through the bush and discover the camp, and it was like, well, that's boring. And uh, opportunities came up; people would hear about it, and I, you know. I went, well, you know, wouldn't it be great if instead of just escaping the camp and running through the bush, they actually stole a car and there was a big car chase with these Mad Max vehicles. And a friend of mine had left uh, his DeLorean with me while he moved to the States. I'm like, oh, if they they stole the DeLorean from the camp, which fit in with the the whole theme of the book, um, it would just be a much cooler way to, um, you know, to escape. And then you know, I'm 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 by this stage I'm trying to you know, I kept thinking how can I make the film better? How can I make it stand out? And I'm like, what's what's cooler than a car chase with a DeLorean? You know, a car chase with ten DeLoreans. And so then I you know, tried to get all the DeLoreans in the country together <laughs> and uh, get them to Canberra for a weekend. Um, and so, you know, there's a five week principal photography. But then over the next year, there were weekends and a week here and, and a week there. And, you know, we shot a lot of stuff that didn't end up in the film or, you know, sec- tiny sections of it ended up in the film. But it was a case of, um, you know, we didn't have a a deliverable date um, other than trying to get it finished in a financial year sort of for the, the offset. But... Um, we'd already missed the one round. So I sort of had a year to play with to get the film finished. So we would cut it together and then we would watch it and go, oh, this section here, we can, you know, we can up that. So we'd go and we'd reshoot some stuff and, um, you know, try and bolster it. And, and of course, we had no money. So if you want it to not be a complete turd, the resource you do have is time. And so... I guess the whole filming of the the project took you know eighteen months. Yeah. Okay. And did you have distribution lined up before you started shooting? Yeah. Look, I think this is the one thing that's really important for people to independents to understand in Australia, anyway. Um, you know, our tax offsets are tied to theatrical distribution, and. I went. A, I raised a whole bunch of money, and I put it in an account, and I didn't touch it at all until I got um, a distribution sign off and the provisional certificate signed off um, for our offset. So that was a lot of work. That took a year of pitching and paperwork and applications and, and whatnot. Because I think once you've got that sign off, you can go out with a bit more confidence to spend a bit more money. Um, knowing that you're going to get a certain return. Um, And often I think you've got to get just that minimum production value to get it over the line. Um, So you've got to raise a bit more money to do that. Whereas um, if I hadn't had distribution attached first, I would have been, again, playing at the much you know probably the under 100 grand um, range rather than you know picking it up to over the 500 threshold um 
because you know getting distribution signed off is literally one of the triggers that that cascades and waterfalls all these other things so getting um yeah so essentially i got i worked really hard to get the distribution signed off before we spent a cent yeah okay and do, doing that distribution pitching and stuff like that was that going out to afm or what how were you getting meetings and stuff like that um yeah it's a really good question look it's there's no short answer to that other than call we we shot a short film proof of concept you know we it was it was calling every friend i knew who was involved and did they know anyone and you know eventually you kind of lead and you speak with people and and all the big players of course are not interested and it's all um chicken and the egg it's like well who have you got attached and you can't get those people attached until you've got financing and you can't get financing until you've got someone attached and so it's um it's sort of uh you know what comes first eventually you know i i managed to get a distributor who was a small distributor but recognized enough um that that they triggered the offset you know sort of it's you've got to be a, a real distributor you can't just sort of um i guess the the funding body needs to know that you're a legitimate distributor and you can get it into the cinemas and that you've committed a certain amount of money so you need to get a um a minimum guarantee sort of up front from them so um yeah there's, there's a whole bunch of check boxes that you have to get and i think you've really got to make sure well you know i made sure that we had those so that i could feel confident to go and spend the money and take the risk because ultimately i was responsible for all the money and and again you know it could have gone the other way it could have all fallen in a heap and <laughs> i would uh wake up with a severed horse head in my bed and um yeah things could have gone otherwise <laughs> <laughs> and when i bumped into you at afm i think you were actually in the process of changing distributors are you happy to talk about that oh yeah look um so that was that was a sales agent um that uh I had a bit of a nightmare experience with look we got them on this sales agent and I thought it was going to be great and you know they promised you know we negotiated hard but um one of the reasons I got Billy Zane in was for international sales and it was all about you know we did US accents and um yeah it, 3 years later I've literally just won my legal battle to get paid and get my rights back so I've just gotten all the rights back for the film um they were a, a nightmare and um you know trick for young players so stay away uh, people just people just lie you know I, I hadn't experienced uh I hadn't experienced people lie to my face with a smile so consistently and so blatantly for so long like i i just uh i didn't realize it was standard practice or or possible and um it, that was big education um so yeah that that was probably when i saw you i was in the midst of despair and you know they keep saying oh you've been paid or we're going to pay you and stuff like that and you know you rely on that money um to to pay people and um yeah i think some of the sales agents um they just have a very dodgy um ethical practice and i found that the industry inherently in attracts some you know ethically dubious characters <laughs> you you've got to have a good bullshit detector and it takes a while to develop that i think yeah that was a big thing that i found at, at afm was just not really knowing who who to trust because everyone's throwing the same yeah. sales spin at you yep and yeah, I think it's just yep. probably do your research and stuff before you make any. Well, I can tell you, I can tell you who not to trust from now <laughs> <laughs> yeah. offline when you are. Yeah. Um, After the show. Yeah, and and yeah, yeah, and how how did you you go with that? Did that um... look like like I said earlier? Um, I only went to AFM last year with screeners, so it was kind of like oh, not without screeners with trailers. Sorry, so they were all like, once we see a screener, you know, then we'll start talking kind of, you know, yeah, money say. Um, 
So yeah, but everyone was just throwing exactly the same spin. We'll get you this. We'll get you that. Blah blah blah. Yeah. So it's just yeah, not not knowing who to trust, and you know, there's like what five days solid of so many people telling me the same thing. I was exhausted by the end of it. Yeah. But um, yeah, I might get a few people back, and we'll do like an AFM special. I think we'll try and get That'd be fantastic. try and get like four of yeah. us on, and we'll um, we'll talk about the experiences and for people who've never been before. So that'll be good. Yeah, it's certainly, um, certainly a rite of passage, I think, trial by fire. Yeah, um, yeah it's cool. But you, you, you're right. Look, I think, I think the whole thing is about trust, and it's really important for me. It's really important to not compromise my ethics and my honesty and my reputation because, you know, I need to have that with my investors, and I need people to trust what I'm saying. Um, and like you say, there's, there's just so much dishonesty that that's out there that, um, it does take you a while to work out who's who. Yeah, definitely. So you wrote a great article about piracy and a conversation you had with a taxi driver. Um, do you want to go and go into that a little bit? And as that affected your film in any way do you think with torrenting and yeah sure um look i mean it's it's a really ongoing and evolving issue with piracy because um you know i have a long version of that article that goes quite uh, deeply into what the future of piracy is going to look like in the digital world above and beyond film and entertainment you know when we start dealing with 3d manufacturing and um all these kinds of things where it's suddenly going to start hitting other industries a lot harder than, than what it does now. Um, people don't understand the way that currently films try and make their money back. Um, you know, you, you make your money back by controlling access to your film in different territories. You know, you sell it in different areas for a certain amount of money for that country to be able to view it and that country to be able to view it and distributors in those countries pay you a certain fee for the rights to do it they don't you know they, they're paying for the right to be able to exploit your film and and on sell it um but those things are getting harder and harder because films are now just a digital file that can be you know you and i are talking literally on the opposite side of the globe in real time so it's just as easy for a digital file to get to the other side of the world as it is to, you know, see it in your own lounge room, um, which introduces a whole bunch of issues. You know, if, if something's really big in the States and everyone's talking about it online and people in the UK want to see it, but th there's no legal way for them to see it, they feel uh, justified in, you know, getting access to that film in you know through torrents and things um and they don't think it's stealing they don't think they're hurting anyone um because they're just watching it what people don't realize at the moment is that you know when things are uploaded to torrent sites and they're available in a territory they weren't available in before um and distributors don't um uh, pay for that because it's like well why would we pay for the right to distribute in our territory when it's already available in our territory you know people are watching it for free it's already out there so i've seen a lot of um yeah a lot of sales not happen because of piracy and and whatnot um and it's a much bigger issue but i think the biggest thing is that most people don't understand the ramifications piracy has down the line and how that affects a filmmaker's ability to get their money back, back and, and pay their crew and then their ability to make the next film and the next film. And it's usually the people who love films who do it, you know? And it's usually the people who are the, literally biting the hand that feeds them because, you know, the, there's a legitimate shift in the technology that's making it... Um, frustrating when you know game of thrones comes out in australia and it's only on foxtel 
and people don't either don't have Foxtel or they don't want to pay Rupert Murdoch money on on, on ethical uh, reasons. Um, so y- your choice is either to torrent it or wait for it to be, you know, wait two months while everyone's talking about it online and try and avoid spoilers. Um, and so people people feel like they're backed into a, you know, and it, these are the people who love the show who 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 steal it, you know. Um, now I'm not saying that that's going to bankrupt HBO, but to a, a an independent producer, it's certainly a different thing. Um, and there's a there's a waterfall in the way that you release a film to monetize it. First in the cinemas, and then you know what was the DVD market, but basically pay per view sections. Um, iTunes, whatnot, and then eventually streaming platforms, because once it's streaming, um, no one's going to rent it for five ninety nine. So people go, "Oh, Netflix bought your film! Yeah, yeah, you half a million dollars. That's amazing!" And Netflix want worldwide rights when they buy it. I mean, like, oh, that's great! Yeah, I got got five hundred grand for my film. Except the film cost me five million dollars, and now it's on Netflix all over the world. I only got half a million dollars back. How do I then make up that other four and a half million dollars? Mm. So you have to be strategic in which platforms you release at a certain time. You have to do your full, you know, cinema run and then, you know, your full sort of D V D run if you can and um then you then your T VOD, your transactional VOD, which is sort of pay per view and then Eventually, at the end of the day, SVOD, which is your subscription VOD, um, you know that's as it stands today, and the model is shifting. You know, every every few months. So, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's interesting. It's a, it's um, good to hear that the kind of distribution process like that. I've never really thought of it in that way. So, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, someone in your situation where you've got a film that's you know finishing up and not released yet you've got a lot of power and options um because once it's out a lot of that sort of gets taken out of your hands so the the strategy of which channels to release when um becomes really important you know if you release it too early on SVOD then you lose your ability to release it on TVOD and make any money so that kind of thing's sort of good to know up front and I, I think I wish someone had of I did as much education as I could myself but I wish I'd have had um, more instruction on that earlier um, rather than just like you say everyone just trying to give you the sales pitch mm. <laughs> so knowing what you know now then everything you've learnt what's next for you I'm going to become a, an accountant and uh, retire somewhere in the Himalayas. <laughs> I'm going to move move to Nepal and live as a goat herder. Sounds like a safe bet. <laughs> Look, we've we've got um, I've got about five projects that are developed to various stages. Um, the biggest one is a Matthew Riley novel that I've got the rights to um, called Contest, which is a film that um, is good to go. Just working on casting at the moment. Um, so getting ready to pitch that, but the bigger the, the project, the longer they take to come on. I need a big distributor on board for that. Um, it's not the kind of film that you want to do badly. Um, then we've got a couple of smaller films that I could do in a similar way to Blue World using the same sort of business model, um, but that only works... I think that business model sort of works up to about a $2 million film, and then after that, um, the math with cast and crew reinvestments and things doesn't sort of work out anymore. You know, you, you need to be able to pay people to to work on your film. Um, they need to be able to afford to work on your film. Um, you can only sort of do a a freebie thing once. A lot, a lot of indie filmmakers, in my opinion, um, you know, they they call in all their favors for this first film. And that's how they get it made, and that's okay. But unless that film, you know, breaks out, then you know you end up 
with a debt and a bunch of filmmakers who won't work with you again. Um, so I'm, it's really important for me to pay everyone. Obviously, you, you can't pay them what they're worth because everyone works so hard and they're skilled and they're amazing and you want to pay them three times as much. But you can certainly make it affordable for them to be able to work on the film. So I'm very big in making sure that as much as possible, everyone who works on the film gets paid. Um, and I'll only make another film if I can do that properly. So what's next is um, hopefully getting uh, contest up. Um, if that doesn't sort of fall in the next couple of months, um, then I've got two smaller films that are um, that are. I've got a, a great documentary on the Freemasons which is really interesting We've got some great access there um, got a sort of a haunted housey one which is um, the tagline for that is does for meditation what Jaws did for the ocean um, so that's kind of going to freak out all the new age hippies for a while um, and then uh, yeah I've got a cool circus film and um, and again and, and we've got a really great um biopic on uh, Lauren Burns who won the gold medal in the Sydney 2000 Olympics for Taekwondo so that's kind of a sport it's sort of rocky for chicks who kick um, so they're, they're you know they're all developed and sort of good to go but um, I equate it to when you're on the playground and people have the skipping ropes and you're sort of standing at the side waiting to work out when to jump in um, it's hard to know because the rules could change at any time. Like there was an election over here and most people thought that Labor would get in and that would change the offset rules significantly. Um, but that didn't happen. The rules currently are, are as they have been. So that's created a whole bunch of flurry of activity different to what people were expecting. So, Okay. Very interesting. Yeah. So where's the best place for people to check out Blue World Order? Um, If you go to bwomovie.com so BWO for Blue World Order bwomovie.com um, there's links to all the online places you can watch it so there's Vimeo On Demand, there's iTunes, there's Google Play Hulu, you know all the sort of online platforms um, you can order a Blu-ray um, or a DVD um, if that's your bag um, but I've actually just sort of gotten the rights back um, so it's only available in a few territories at the moment because I wanted to yeah be able to get it into the other territories properly um, and it's not actually out in the UK yet which I'm hoping to get out you know this year um, but again you know I want to make sure we get a proper deal and it doesn't just get some great films just get put out online and you know you're sort of pissing in the wind and <laughs> trying to trying to get people to notice them so yeah it's really important to release them properly cool and what about your social media channels yeah so look i'm i'm big on facebook blue world order is um, on facebook um i'm not so big on the other channel like instagram and and twitter and whatnot we <laughs> we're not as active there as we could be because it's a full-time gig basically yeah um, but certainly, yeah, Facebook, check out um, bwomovie.com, Blue World Order, the film on Facebook, um, or, you know, hit me up at Che Baker and um, that. most of my page is basically film promotion anyway. So. <laughs> no, it's awesome. Everyone should go check out the film. Go to um, bwo.com, was it? Bwomovie. Oh, yep. bwomovie.com. So, yeah, we'll go and check that out and help support the film because, yeah, you're killing the industry by pirating and stuff like that. I've got a... Uh, I'm, I might post that article. There's a link to it on Contact Cafe. It goes into a little bit of the a little bit of the uh, specifics about what piracy actually does and how that impacts the, the industry. And I think if more people understood it, they would be far happier to not pirate and actually, you know, um, help support making the films that they love to watch yeah exactly well send that link to me and I'll put that into the show notes as well so people can have a read of that because it, it's a great read thank you um, 
And that's it for today, mate. Thanks so much for your time. It's been really insightful. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Appreciate your time. And um, hopefully we'll catch you up at AFM this year and we'll go and um, have some beers in a dive bar somewhere. Absolutely. (laughs) Sounds great. (laughs) Cheers, mate. (coughs) Cheers. Thanks again to everyone for listening. Please leave any comments. Don't forget to subscribe and let's all help support indie film. And I'll see you next week for another episode of Action Cut and Everything In Between. Action Cut and Everything In Between. A comprehensive guide to shooting a feature film all on your own.